What's up everyone? It's Jason and in this video we're going to be talking about the differences between organizational blocks, function blocks, and function calls and a little bit about how and when to use them. Stick around at the end because I'm going to be giving a couple of little tips in order for you to become a seasoned Siemens programmer, even if you aren't. Let's jump in. Time out before we get started. I just wanted to make a point to say that I'm going to use a couple of terms in here that as a PLC programmer, you may not know, but if you're used to designing hardware or working with microcontrollers or maybe higher level programming, they might sound familiar to you. I do this so that maybe you can find a connection to PLCs that you're familiar with. So back to your program. Let's jump in by talking about organizational blocks or OBs for short. Technically, OBs are code blocks that have predefined execution cycles. Don't worry, it just means that if you include an OB, you get to write what it does, but for the most part, the PLC determines when it executes. The most famous of these, because it's required for any program to run on a controller, is OB1. This is a cyclic function that as long as the processor is in run, this block executes over and over as fast as possible, creating our cycle time. Now, there are many other OBs, including some that use such things such as the hardware timers to execute at given intervals. Some people call them interrupt subroutines. Blocks that execute when there is a rack fault, for example, and there's even one that execute if you somehow find a way to misprogram something. Usually it's a divide by zero. If you have questions about a specific OB, drop a comment below. All right, I'm gonna jump in here for a second. I promise it'll be the last time. So I just wanted to make a point in saying that function blocks and function calls are Siemens' way of making an object-oriented programming languages on a PLC. Yeah, you have other languages like ST that do this a lot better, but you can absolutely use the concepts of recursion and things like that. And you also can get into some of the problems with memory leaks and things like that if you're not really designing these blocks very well. I just wanted to step in so when you're going through this, you understand that this is almost, almost, object-oriented programming. All right, back to it. Function calls do not have any permanent local memory. They only have inputs, outputs, inouts, and temp memory. These values are defined in the block interface and show up as parameters when you call the block as shown. Call the block either by dragging the block into your code or name an empty block the name of your FC and it will call all of that code. You can call this block almost as many times as you want. You're only limited by your processor and how well you write your code. More on how to write these blocks well at the end. Inside your block, inputs can only be read, not modified. Outputs are able to be read and written. Inouts can be read and written as well, but there's a big difference that we'll talk about later on between these and outputs. Lastly, Temp and constant memory only exist inside of the block, and temp memory is only available for one pass through through the block. This means that all temp values start at their start values every time you enter the block. If you need to save a value, you need to use a function block, which we will discuss now. Function blocks are everything that an FC is, but they have permanent memory area called static memory that saves data between cycles. This doesn't sound like much of a difference, but it allows you to write what are essentially many programs and use them over and over inside of your main program. I'll show you an example from a program that controls a plant with around 100 conveyors and motors. Each motor operates similarly, so I was able to write a block called Ag Starter Control and use it in most places that has a motor. I even use this block inside of more complicated function blocks. Now, it took me a little while longer to write this block initially, but it has saved me hundreds of hours that I can use providing customers with custom features that set us apart from others. In this block, I have inputs that are common for most starter controlled motors, including start inputs, e-stops, and various sensors that are used in agriculture. My outputs represent such things as starter coils, sequencing timers, and status word that can be tied to HMI faceplates by using a single tag. Lastly, 
there is a bit of static data that is used to make this code work. And sometimes, you might want to use this static data elsewhere in your program. Fear not, when you call an FB, the system creates what is called an instance data block with all the data that's in the function block and you can access it like any other data block, even writing directly to it. Now, this is the power of function blocks. Now, for some tips on writing good blocks. First, while there's nothing wrong with it technically, please don't write everything in OB1. Sure, some simple programs are fine, but if you're using anything other than the built-in I.O. on a 1200 PLC, break your code into FCs and FB. It might run the same, but it is much more simple to troubleshoot and make changes if you use OB1 as essentially a call block, and for the most part, just call FCs and FBs. Second, if you find yourself cutting and pasting code, use an FC or an FB. Make that code a function block. You will spend much more time and energy fixing bugs if you don't use function calls and function blocks. Third, be efficient. The whole point of these blocks is to reuse this code. So if you are wasteful, either with clock time, memory, whatever, it will cause you problems eventually. This is not Python running on 32 cores and 64 gig of memory. You can absolutely crash your processor if you're sloppy, especially if you are writing in OBs. Memory's tight. So if you use a lot of arrays or data sets, you might want to consider using in and out memory in your block. In and outs are stored elsewhere and are essentially borrowed for your block instead of copied like static memory. This is called passing by reference in other languages, by the way. I'll do another video about more advanced programming later that will include examples of how and why you would want to do this. Lastly, to write reusable code, you have to see all hashtags. If not, your code will only work in the program it currently is. Let's look at an example. If you don't see hashtag, it means that that value is either a tag in a tag table, a DB, or somewhere else that will not be automatically loaded when you drag your function block into your new program. Sure, you can make it work by modifying the code, but why not make it to where you don't have to remember to add this tag? Plus, you don't even know if that memory bit has already been used in your new program. So, to accomplish this, you have to have all variables, timers, and even other FBs available in your block call, either being passed in or in static memory. I'll admit, this can get pretty complicated sometimes, so I'll cover that in the advanced function block design video. The last thing I want to give you advice on is plan ahead and adapt often. You want to try and understand what you want the block to do first, then design the interface. Then you can start writing your code. You are going to have to change things as you go. So stay flexible, but you need to have a good idea of what you want it to look like going in. Otherwise, you will end up with something that isn't helpful. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it helpful, hit that like button. And if you find yourself looking up content like this often, consider subscribing as I plan on doing weekly uploads. And finally, always, if you have questions, feel free to comment down below and I'll try to answer your questions as soon as possible. Until the next video, stay curious. Bye.